because if you set up a company that say you're going to save 1.35 million lives a year and then you you know your own staff are like working 24 7 and they they're crashing their car because they haven't slept enough you're kind of you know you're full of crap is how i look at it Hello and welcome to The Big Tech Show with me, Adrian Weckler, in association with Square. Square helps you look after your business needs from payments to menu management to online ordering. Visit square.com for more. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Barry Lunn, founder and CEO of Provisio, a company that has developed radar technology and uses laser beams to create a 3D representation of the area and potential hazards surrounding your vehicle. Barry, welcome to the podcast. Hey Adrian, thanks for having me. Great to be here. This idea came to you during a car crash. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that that that's one way of putting it. I suppose it 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 re it uh, raised its head again for me after a car crash. Yeah. So I had I've been kind of working in the mostly in the aerospace business, but in high frequency electronics for for more than twenty years. So most of my career, basically. And towards the end of my previous company, it started working in the automotive space and started working on autonomous vehicles, right? Solving, they were all having little problems. And uh, we started working on trying to solve some of those problems. And uh, long story short, I I sold the company and I was done. And I kind of never wanted to see an automotive company for the rest of my life for for many reasons. And then I had another car crash, uh, which was... And and it, just the way my mind works, I just couldn't leave it alone. So I went home that night and Sorry, I just t- started going. T- just that. Tell me about the car crash, though. What happened? I was pretty innocuous. It was a, it, it's that stretch of that bloody M uh, uh, M7 uh, there around Bird Hill that basically everyone crashes. The, the weather changes suddenly. And um, next thing you're on an ice skating rink. The road is terrible there. They've they, 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 like. The usual thing, like they put now, they put in, you know, uh, speed cameras. Like that's going to solve anything. Um, so, so it was on that stretch. Basically, we got a sudden hail shower, and you know, just just the, the car completely lost it. Um, I was lucky enough. I had actually during that time working with the autonomous groups, I'd done some advanced driving courses on like slipways and stuff like that. So I was actually able to bring the car. I I never spun out. Uh, like on that stretch, I think that same day there was like nine cars written off or something, and so I I spun out, did a couple of twirls, but I got I got it back uh, in in place and just did a minor bit of damage actually to the rear of the car, uh, basically pulling it over to the side. But there was a bus coming behind me as well, which kind of concentrated the mind a little bit. Um, and so I suppose yeah. Then I, then I went home that evening and I went, oh, there were so many elements. And then I started analysing the crash and I started breaking it down. And I thought about, well, what if I could have seen this? But also then I started thinking about, what about the fact that like ninety nine percent of drivers don't ever get to do the driving course I got to do in Los Angeles with slipways and all that fun stuff. And then I kind of you know it went back. And that was kind of I think the spark I suppose that kind of went because. I'll tell you, the reason I didn't really enjoy the autonomous industry was because I found it really boring. Um, I found the people in it quite boring, um, that they were they're just like driving around in circles in Arizona and high five and thinking they were great for us. Um, and I found that whole scene a bit, you know, trite and raising billions, spending billions of money on stuff that everyone knew would never work. Right. But then I started thinking, holy crap, there's like a really interesting problem here. Which is car crashes, right? And they, they, they're they nuts. And then I started digging into that. And then I went down a rabbit hole that you never want to go down and came out the other end of it with kind of this concept of 5D perception. Wrote it down on, you know, your stereotypical back of the envelope type thing. And that that, that was really the genesis of, of Provisio. After that, I kind of went out and spoke to people way smarter than me. Uh, which is can be pretty easy to find, and put it in front of them and said, "Hey, what what do you think it is?" And unfortunately, they all thought it was a good idea, and we are where we are now. It's a it's a company, and it's called Provisio. Yeah, and you're saying that you think this provides you know a true path to autonomy. Having just slagged off the uh, the autonomous vehicle industry in Arizona, you you, you think that this technology will actually 
help it to happen. It's a safety first strategy, you say, to achieve total autonomy and eliminate accidents. How long is it going to be until we actually see autonomous vehicles? I have a good friend uh, who's, who's an OG, we'll say, of the autonomous industry. And I, I was speaking to him recently about this. And it, I, he said, when, when anyone asked me uh, 10 years ago, how far away was autonomy? I said about 10 years. And he said, and if you ask me today, I'd say about 10 years. And if you ask me in 10 years time, I'll say about 10 years. Um, Why is it moving cares, so slowly? I would say, Adrian, who cares? Let's solve like the actual problem first, right? And, 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 and I mean that in terms of like, just as an interesting engineering problem to resolve as well, right? Like, so back to the origin, like how I ended up in this space was we were brought in to solve what they call the edge cases, right? Um, or what I call the hard bit, right? Like, like nothing matters, only the edge cases, like everything. And, and I come, I, I suppose I have a bias coming from, aerospace background right like working with the likes of nasa the european space agency and these and when you go in there day one with a concept or a product or something you want to put on a satellite you have to prove that this technology and the substrate you're going to use to build it and everything else can work in a space environment right naturally enough that to me seems very logical whereas the autonomous industry was like yeah, yeah, we'll deal with the actual weather and the roads later. Let's just drive around in circles for now. And that, that, that's where, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to solve. And that's why I see this as being the path there. It's not a case of like, you, you, know, you, you know, I want to solve accidents, so therefore this should be the path. It's a case of, well, let's solve the hard bit first. And then everything else kind of becomes easier. But also, you get rid of all the ethical arguments as well, right? Because all those ethical arguments were only driven by the fact that we were going to go in the opposite direction, that we were going to go from driving in circles mm. into more complex circles. Yeah. So, so I, I, I think that's more where I'm coming from. I'm driving a car with Provisio technology on board, and it can tell me what sort of hazards are coming up quite a distance away from me, and so will will enable me to brake. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Essentially, what we see is like a one kilometer cocoon all around the vehicle. So you can imagine, right? You can't do that. First off, we 360 degree insight. So we can see everywhere all around you, right? We can also like we can also tell the exact range and velocity of every object within that one kilometer cocoon, right? You can't, by the way, you're always guessing when you're coming out at a junction you're making an educated guess based on your experience of where that car is and how fast it's moving, right? We get that wrong quite a lot. We know how fast that car is moving. The other thing that we are quite good at is we're able to see beyond human line of sight. So we actually, we're using millimeter waves. So we're bouncing along around vehicles and on to the next one and on to the next one. So while you can see the car just directly in front of you and when he breaks, you break, right? And that's what happened to me in my accident, right? The guy in front of me break, he took off. And so I'm in that game. It doesn't matter how good a driver I am. Hey, guess what? We're all in this together. So what I'm able to do is with Provisio, we're able to see the car, five cars ahead of you. We're able to see that car decelerate before its brake lights come on. You don't get to see that car's deceleration until the guy right in front of you's brake lights come on. So that kind of thing, that's the kind of foresight you kind of have to be able to see. And then there's a ton of stuff you can build up on top of that. But rear endings is like 50% of accidents, mm. right? So start there, I say. So this is tailor made for car manufacturers? Yeah, there, there's kind of, it, it, there's general perception, I guess, that we're building that essentially can, has lots of applications, right? So there's, there's tons of different people like in the mobility. We try to focus somewhat on mobility that are, that, are, that are using the tech right now and trying it. And, and people keep coming up with weird and wonderful ideas on how to do it. But in terms of what will shift the needle for us and what will, you know, you know how, how we become a bloody big company and have a huge impact on this, because the only way you can impact this is at scale. That's automotive, right? And that, that is series production, they call it, which is basically car manufacturers designing you into their next generation of vehicles. And that tends to be like millions of units. And that's where all the economies of scale come in and everything else that now you're able to deliver millions of these and at a price. I mean, the big thing for me, by the way, was 
could we deliver this at a price point that you could put in every car, not in, you know, a Waymo or a cruise vehicle, uh, but that you could get onto every vehicle. So that those things can only really be solved with scale, right? Um, and, and, and that's what we're at. I want to change tack a little bit. Um, you went to art college. Was that a good idea? <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 if there's any parents listening, they're turning off right now. So yeah, our, our college was was a, a good decision for me, right? I think that that was a big thing because school itself hadn't hadn't really worked for me. I had left a couple of times. I was dyslexic, and we didn't know a lot about that in in the eighties and nineties in Ireland. So I was diagnosed as a lazy shite, and so I, I uh, re-diagnosed myself as being a creative. And it, it, when it came to the decision, it was really down to engineering or, or our college. And my, my mom had a big role there. She kind of stepped in and talked to me and said, you know what? This is what you love. Do, do something you love, which not too many mammies would have done back then. Um, and, and you'll find your position. And I'm a big believer in that to this day, right? Like this whole, like there's way too much pressure put on kids around what they should be and where the jobs, no one, especially today, no one can predict where the world is going, where jobs are going. Like, I mean, how could I have predicted that I'd end up working in the you know, vehicle industry and in, in this side of things, that I'd end up, you know, living in whatever number of countries and working with space agencies and all that. So there's no way, like, you can predict that stuff when you're 15, 16. So our college was brilliant. And the great thing our college taught me was how to be uh, self-critical. Um, so artists are really good at that, by the way, of, of putting the work up in front of people and working through a process to to redefine and redefine and, and come to a place where, where they're happy. And I think that 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 alone um, stuck with me through the whole thing. But the other thing is it helped me to find kind of my love of learning again um, because it was in the right environment for me where I wasn't being told I was this or that. Uh, I was also diagnosed with dyslexia while I was in college. So the whole thing kind of came together for me really well. But it, it's definitely something I would always relate to, to young people when I talk to them is, is to think think about that. Um, you have a four day week at Provisio, is that right? How does that work in a startup? <laughs> God, you you've done your research. Um, we do. Um, I'll tell you what. I, I'm obsessed. Like the, the the four day week thing is is comes down to another obsession of mine. Like I'm I'm obsessed with understanding how we work and and uh, trying to unlock efficiencies. But one of the pillars of when we set up the company and I, 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 I saw my last company and going again and making that decision was I didn't want to ruin anyone's life. Um, I think we'd be this obsession, especially with startups. And I've, I've had, you know, I have a bunch of mates who've done really well out of startups, but I have a bunch of mates who, you know, life hasn't been good. Right. And, and it, it, it not just broken companies, but broken marriages, broken everything, broken people out the end of them. And I think that's a, a reality of startups that doesn't get talked about enough. So one thing I thought about, I, I, was, a, I was in a position that I could afford to fail, um, that I could go and do this and maybe go a bit bigger this time and, 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 and that side of things. But I thought, I'm going to bring a team along with me. So I, I, I want to bring people along and, and that they actually enjoy the process, learn from the process. And also, you know, I'm not going to ruin their lives. I'm not going to, you know, because I don't believe in it, by the way. I don't think you get any more efficiency that way. So then what we started doing was like we basically built in programs into the company from day one where we, you know, uh, uh, the other side of it is if you set up a company that say you're going to save 1.35 million lives a year and then, you you know, your own staff are like working 24 seven and they they're crashing their car because they haven't slept enough. You are kind of, you know, you're full of crap is how I look at it. So. So basically, those things were all resonating with me. So I started started thinking about it in that regard. And, and and measuring things, and so we run agile within the organization, and and you know the whole Scrum side of things. And so we measured the hell out of everything we did. We we're able to see our performance matrices, and we expect really high performance out of everyone. And what we discovered was we were able to actually reduce meeting time significantly. And then we survey everyone in the organization. We're a small organization. It sounds like you know I'm I'm Google here. We're a small organization, but we were surveying everyone, and we were doing this with with uh, University of Limerick. Uh, at the time as well we asked them to put an academic lens on it we're serving what people like you know and the number one thing that like we've some brilliant people in the organization the number one thing they all love about working in provisio versus anywhere else they ever work is being left alone to do work 
right? And I, we've all seen it in organizations that there's someone, and it's usually a, a meddler like me, uh, interrupting consistently saying, I need this, I need that. Um, and so we introduced almost the corrals to keep me away from the engineering team um, and introduced systems that allowed us to build an organization that was super efficient. And that allowed, that allowed us to roll out the four-day work week. And to put that in perspective, in the la- like we did that last year, and, and as I say, work gets done outside of meetings. Work gets done when people are focused work hours, as we would call them. And we've actually increased, even though we brought in a, a four-day work week, we've increased the number of focused work hours that all of our engineers get to, to, to do their job because we've reduced meeting time. So... Meeting times are not, I suppose, they're interesting. When you're new into the company, uh, the culture is quite funny, I guess. It, it can seem abrupt. Uh, but, you know, when you're, when you're going over, you're allotted five minutes for the meeting. Someone's going to cut you off. Uh, but it's incredible. And, and you can imagine for a verbose person like me, it puts a lot of discipline on you. But it, it works. It just works. How it will scale will be interesting as well. We're going to keep measuring it. It's been primarily an engineering focused team. Now it's becoming more of a sales focused team. So again, we're doing a lot of work on that and how we're going to measure that. And that. But that even puts a discipline on the organization because if the product needs 24 seven engineering care and 24 seven sales care, we've probably built the wrong product. So that kind of brings a discipline into the organization as well. Of Well, you know, if you, if you want your four day work week, Build a product that doesn't need you on a Saturday evening, right? And that, that's kind of the, the quid pro quo within the organization. So, yeah, it, it works. And, and, and to be fair, look, I'll, I, you know, I'll be honest, I, I don't really deal well with time off. So I, I probably am the only one that doesn't really do the four-day work week. But what it has done is probably reduced me to a five-day work week, which is pretty awesome because I, I now have a day that I can kind of actually do all the stuff that, that, that I need to do. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's been incredible. For us, and uh, we're going to share all that data. Um, we're going to open source the stuff we've done because it's it's pretty cool stuff, like in a really nerdy kind of way. But I think it's really cool stuff. Barry, I could talk to you all day, uh, but unfortunately, we have to to wrap it up. Uh, unfortunately, anyone who wants to find out more can go to Provisio.ai. And uh, with that, I'm going to say thank you very much to you, Barry Lund, founder and CEO uh, of Provisio. Thanks also to Tabitha Monaghan, who produced today, to Conan Doherty on uh, video and to Gav Hennessy on sound. And for me, Adrian Weckler, this has been The Big Tech Show in association with Square. And I'll talk to you the same time next week. 